took an encryption key from the time the Batman Arkham City. What words can summarize this game perfectly? How about modern lingo like, it's the GOAT. THE GOAT! <laughs> With Arkham Asylum's success, a sequel was only inevitable. And what a sequel it is. It did almost everything right. I say almost. It improved on many of its predecessor's elements, but there are some notable flaws, primarily with the story. Still, let's start with the premise first. It's been a few years since Arkham Asylum. The facility and its sister prison, Blackgate Penitentiary, have been closed down in favor of a more drastic measure, Arkham City. Every criminal has been shoved into a walled-off section of Gotham, loosely enforced by its warden, Hugo Strange, and his PMC, the Tiger Units. I say loosely because the city has erupted into a gang war, and Strange allows it to happen. Seeing this, Bruce Wayne wants to see Arkham City shut down, but Strange captures him during a speech and reveals that he knows who Bruce truly is and that something called Protocol 10 can finally commence. It will be my legacy, a monument to your failure. And if you try to stop me, I guarantee everyone will know your secret. A slow but very strong opening sequence follows, introducing the player to the basic mechanics and escaping the clutches of the vengeful penguin. Then we can finally play as Batman to stop Strange's plans. For now. First, technical issues. While I haven't faced anything significant until near the end of my playthrough, I have encountered a few glitches, mostly with character models clipping into the environment. He's fine. For the presentation, there have been some minor tweaks and major implications. The graphics are pretty much the same as Asylum's, except there is almost no cell shading. In the last game, the cell shading and drab color scheme helped contribute to a somewhat horror-esque vibe, with dark and almost ink-like colors making everything out to be something from a comic book. In Arkham City, there isn't that much of a horror vibe. Instead, character models and environments have a distinct sharpness, and the colors, while still dark and dirty, have an almost muted look. Players coming from Asylum will notice the difference if they look close enough. The presentation has improved in terms of overall art direction and scope. Each section of the map is distinct, especially the interiors, most of which are personifications of the respective gang leaders. Two-Face's courtroom is split down the middle and has recruitment posters reminiscent of Uncle Sam. The museum is whatever Penguin could get his hands on, with his own voice commentary. Then there's the juggerization of the steel mill, both outside and in. You immediately know whose territory is whose. But that's not all. Different gangs have distinctive outfits, with Two Faces men and their worn down masks, Penguin's goons looking like a military corporation themselves, and Joker's men being, well, Jokers. Even enemy emplacements are different in each region. Park Row will have unarmed henchmen below while the armed ones patrol the rooftop. The area around the steel mill will have enemies plotted in small numbers, but will be more heavily defended the closer you venture in. And the Bowery will have almost all armed units both above and below street level. But I'm not done yet. The eastern part of Arkham City is flooded for mysterious reasons, and there's a whole lower section dedicated to abandoned train terminals, sewers, and even the remnants of what is called Old Gotham or Wonder City. You can find a shanty town built by political prisoners who stand no chance against the rough and tough criminals. The overall area has been well thought out and meticulously crafted, like they had an architect and an artist collaborate on how the city should be constructed in-game. However, one downside is that the game world is not as dynamic or ever-changing as Asylum's. You may see a few things change here and there, like a blown up bridge, and shifts in power and territory among the gangs. I kept thinking about how they could have gone much further with this concept. How cool would it have been if we had a multiplayer component with rival gangs competing for territory and Batman swooping in to stop them? That's what they did with Origins. Sound design is essentially the same, with a few additional weapons like shotguns and mines. But Batman's finishers have gone from a 
into this. It's like God is casting Divine Smite on Batman's hands. What has noticeably improved is the music, which has more variety. The combat music has changed dramatically, from Asylum Zump beat and somewhat symphonic melodies to more sweeping and dramatic orchestras. It better emphasizes the battles taking place. The same goes for Predator encounters, but in a different way. Each track starts somberly, a calm before the storm. As you begin taking down bad guys, the musical strings heighten, adding tension and suspense. But not for you, it's for them. What does Freeze do here anyway? No idea. All I know is Penguin wants it. Good enough for me. Making us look stupid. How's he doing it? Shut the hell up. We need to keep looking. Ah! Keep from over here. I'm sure of it. As for voice work, Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill return as Batman and Joker. Conroy's acting is pretty much the same, but his lines emphasize some characteristics that were somewhat noticeable in Asylum. He displays a stoic but caring side with his friends, family, or innocent civilians. He doesn't put himself over others, but doesn't show emotional vulnerability with them either. I can handle it. You're needed in Gotham. Things could get worse. Much worse. You think? If Strange really knows who you are, what happens if he tells everyone? How will you... Trust me, I'll find a way. With villains, he's usually either brutal or unempathetic. This is all he told me. As I am sure you are aware, my parents were dead and I was rich. So rich I could have anything I wanted, but of course, all I wanted was them back. I now know that that was impossible, of course, that their death served a higher purpose. But back then, I had yet to experience the joy of cold steel cutting through warm flesh. I had no idea how I could save these people from the relentless misery of their existence. You should have stayed that way. I won't get into character analysis here, but I find his interactions with certain characters interesting and consistent. Then there's Joker. Nice of you to say, but you of all people should know there's plenty wrong with me. After Arkham Asylum, Joker wasn't entirely cured of Titan, and it's killing him. So, in the sequel, Mark Hamill is portraying a more hoarse, sickly Joker, who still has that psychopathic enthusiasm. Take my blood, for example. I wish somebody would. This stuff is killing me. Why should I care? <laughs> because now, there's a teeny little bit of me in you too, bats. Oh, come on. <laughs> Don't tell me it's not what you always wanted. Look, we're running out of time. I need your help. I nearly had a cure. It was so close, and then it was taken from me. So we both die. I'm fine with that. Also, I just love how Conroy plays Batman in this scene. 
I'll give context later, but Batman not giving a dang that he's poisoned along with Joker shows how selfless he truly is. The additional characters are well voiced, particularly the villains. For example, Troy Baker as Two-Face. The only way to get by in this place is to get ourselves some respect. Be here. That's how we get respect. Show them all that we do things. We should be fair though. This is a place of justice after all. Screw justice. Kill her and they'll all fear us. And the one north is Penguin. Listen. I'm what you might call a collector. If someone wants it, I like to think I've got it. And if I don't have it, <laughs> I'll get it. Yeah, so Penguin is British in this game. Batman. A radical change from his American counterparts. Just Not even no one north knows why this is. Penguin explaining which part of London his accent's from. I'm not really quite sure, and neither is anyone else. But hey, Rocksteady is a British company, so it's their fault, not mine. Thanks, Nolan. On top of that, you get a couple of new voices in your ears, including good old Alfred, played by Martin Jarvis. So, it's the world's greatest detective versus the world's deadliest assassin. Who's going to win? There are a few I can't go into without spoilers, but plenty of side characters are here, and they are a considerable enhancement over Asylum. It also helps that the facial animations have mostly improved. Will do. Hope you find the doc. Her name's Stacy Baker. She's one of the good ones. I said mostly. There are also the criminals around Arkham City, who you can listen to from a distance. There were similar conversations in Asylum, but they bordered on psychopathy and were probably too much for the average viewer. Here, it's mainly about Arkham City's living conditions and a few changes that can happen within the game world. Man, it's cold in here. Tell me about it. Do you remember winners being like this? You know, when you were a kid? Nah, every year it's a little colder. Me, I blame freaks like Freeze. I heard he likes it cold. Figure he's the one cooling the planet. No way me driving a few blocks did it. So, with all that out of the way, gameplay. Fundamentally, it's the same as Asylum, but has been built upon and nearly perfected. Nearly. I won't repeat much, so if you want an overview of the basics, check out my Arkham Asylum review. First, let's talk about exploration. Unlike Asylum, City is an open world, so you can do whatever you like within the game's restraints. You can divert from the main story and delve into other content, unless barred off by insufficient inventory. However, being an open world, gliding and grappling have become the main means of traversal. I briefly mentioned gliding and Asylum because Besides glide kicking, there wasn't much utility for it. In Arkham City, gliding is the primary way you travel, but you slowly descend and must dive bomb intermittently to keep yourself in the air. For the first few times, it feels and looks how Batman would travel, imitating a giant bat. However, there isn't much variation to it, and the only places to do cool tricks are where the AR missions are located. You need to do the AR missions anyway to unlock the grapno boost which allows you to launch yourself from a gargoyle or rooftop's edge to stay in the sky. Even then, it becomes uneventful before long. It's not tiresome, but it makes me think that Spider-Man 2 and PS4 have more exciting traversal systems. Still, for the places gliding can't take you, gadgets can help. The old reliables from Asylum are back, and a few have received significant upgrades. For example, the line launcher helps get across pits, but now you can change trajectory mid-flight, and, with an upgrade, walk on it like a trapeze. The remote batarang, which was from Asylum but I forgot to mention it, can be controlled manually and hold electric currents to destroy fuse boxes. The most significant change is the crypto sequencer, which has changed from getting the right wavelength to a word scramble game. Now, let's get into the new additions. The Remote Electric Current, or REC, is the only gun Batman allows himself to use, for now. And can charge electric devices like generators, with different effects depending on which fire button you use. The Freeze Blast covers exhaust pouring out from certain pipes and creates platforms on almost all bodies of water. Later on, you get a disruptor device that can disable guns and, after a side mission, destroy mines in certain puzzles. 
Smoke pellets are supposed to be a stealth item, but turn out to be the most versatile tool next to the Batarang. You could set up ambushes before combat encounters, create a diversion during fights, and escape sticky situations during predator encounters. However, these are general uses. Let's get into the combative aspects. Like I said, combat is the same fundamentally, so to change things up, I dropped the controller in favor of a keyboard and mouse. It was... an adjustment period. I like that the special moves can be used with a button tap, unlike the Xbox 360 controller's two button input. Still, doing ground takedowns and consistent counters took me a while. When I did get used to it, I could better appreciate the improvements made to Batman's arsenal. For one, the Wayne Tech menu is back and has a whole suite of new upgrades. Your stun move now leads into a beatdown animation or a springboard move that definitely isn't breaking spines or ribs. There are new special moves like the multi takedown which does as the name implies, or something simple like disarming and destroying guns or other implements so criminals can't use them against you. My favorite has to be the free flow focus, which I neglected to get until later. Don't be like me guys, get this move as soon as possible. Why? Because when you reach a combo of 12, time slows down around you, meaning you have more time to react to enemies attacking or to decide your next move. It breaks when an enemy hits you, when you do a special move, or when you use upgraded versions of gadget. To me, this adds a layer of strategy to combat. Will you keep focus up forever, or will you sacrifice it for a special move or gadget that may help turn the tide? Speaking of gadgets, they have many more uses in combat. You could use them in Asylum, but they never felt necessary or viable. In Arkham City, that has changed. The back claw can slam a guy to the ground, but can leave you exposed if you're not careful. Explosive gel is now a trap that can knock over multiple enemies. The wreck dazes an enemy, while freeze blast can outright freeze enemies in place. And when you get their upgrades for free flow focus, they can potentially reduce the threat of large enemy hordes. You can keep your repertoire to just takedowns, counters, and the like, but gadgets are now an optimal strategy. Whatever you decide to use though, it's all in service towards dealing with the new and reworked enemy types. Knives in Arkham City are far different from Asylum. Instead of stunning and hitting enemies with shivs, you can hit them directly, but they have three attacks which you have to dodge in a row. Upgraded, you can follow rhythm of pressing the dodge and movement button sequentially for an instant takedown. And I mean instant. Titan enemies are back and come with new attacks to use when mounted. Charge! Though the usual batarang and run tactic won't work. You have to stun them three times to attack them properly. Besides those, there's also armored enemies who take the place of the knife enemies from Asylum. You either have to stun and lay a beating on them or use a special takedown. You can also use stun three times to do a ground takedown if you wish. Shields are now part of the enemy's arsenal, which is where the springboard knockdown comes in. Optionally, you can bounce off of him and land on the guy a distance away. Finally, there are ninjas with swords. You can't do ground takedowns on them because they get up immediately, but you can fight them as you normally would. You can even do the blade dodge takedowns, but their attacks are quick when not in free flow focus, and come out as four strikes instead of the typical three. Then there's the predator encounters. You have predator moves from the start, and there are many new moves to take down enemies. There's double takedowns, takedowns from above scaffoldings, floor grates, weak walls, vents, corner takedowns, and the usual ones. The silent variations also have smash takedowns for a hit and run play style. Gadgets even provide new ways to mess with enemies. Using the wreck on generators steal the guns of nearby enemies. The disruptor turns off guns, but can also blow up mines and take down anyone standing near them. Smoke pellets help get away from situations previously challenging to accomplish in Asylum. Freeze Blast still freezes a guy in place, but permits a unique takedown and can be placed as a mine. Finally, the optional freeze cluster does the same for multiple enemies. All the new gadgets 
plus the old ones, provide many options and playstyles for experimentation. Of course, these new options also mean new enhancements to the AI. Criminals will be more wary of the takedowns you do, or where you retreat to. If enemies get smart about the gargoyles or generators, they'll be destroyed. If an unconscious body is near a floor grate, they will check the floor grate. When they start to get frantic, individual henchmen freak out over odd noises or almost shoot each other at certain times. But more than that, enemies have found ways to counter Batman's tricks. There are signal jammers that distort detective vision. You can take the guy with the jammer down first, or save him for last as an extra challenge. There are also night vision guys who can potentially see you on gargoyles, but you can pretty much nullify that effect with upgrades. I was surprised that night vision guys could see you through smoke pellets, something I have never known for years. Also, the snipers that occasionally appeared in Asylum Story are now a part of Predator encounters, though they have tunnel vision and will only spot you if you're in their red dotted sights. Finally, let's talk about additional content. Riddler and his trophies are back, but he's stepped up his game. Notably, he's taken hostages to elaborate death traps you can only find once you solve enough Riddler trophies. The riddles and trophies are a bit more challenging, and they even use the new gadgets in the traversal system. The maps that helped find these riddles are gone, instead replaced by informants that must be interrogated. They are easy to find due to glowing greener than the Lantern Core, but must be saved for last, otherwise you'll have to wait a while for another one to spawn. Then there is the addition of physical challenges, requiring you to complete specific tasks, usually performing a particular move multiple times or completing an encounter in a certain way. It helps that enemies respawn and that the challenges aren't too taxing, unlike the next game. Yet, Riddler is only one of the optional baddies this time. You get side missions called Most Wanted, which task you with stopping criminals that are not part of the main narrative. They range from repeated objectives occasionally to just being one-offs, but I like them for a couple of reasons. A few missions show off the new investigations, a step up from Asylum's mediocre take. It isn't much, but it almost feels like an actual investigation, connecting clues and following trails or bullet trajectories, instead of being a dog following a specific scent. The side missions also emphasize other villains like Zaz, whom I will admit to not mentioning in Asylum, though his role was so minor it didn't feel worth mentioning. His missions in Arkham City give us a glimpse into his demented mind and develop him as a character. They called him the Penguin, <laughs> even back then. He had both eyes, of course, that little accident hadn't happened yet. <laughs> And both of them were looking at me when I put down my cards. Six of clubs. Six of diamonds. Oh, he looked scared. He leaned forward and I could smell the cigar stench on his breath. The six of spades and finally, the six of hearts. I felt good. And then he started laughing. He belched out smoke and he put his cards down on the table. Card by card, my heart sank. A three, a four, a five, a six, a damn seven! His straight flush ended me there. I was lost and thrown out into the city to die. Penniless. It's one of the reasons why I'm glad Arkham City is more open allowing side missions like these to exist and giving villains a spotlight. Getting into DLC territory, they added three other playable characters. They play mostly the same as Batman, but with different animations, gadgets, and even their own brand of detective vision. They also have special moves, but these don't impact the battle as much as Batman's does, at least in my opinion. Still, they present new ways of bruising and scarring bad guys, which I will go over character by character. Starting with Catwoman, I'm going to be honest, I never liked playing her back then, and I still don't. It's not because she's a bad character or not unique, she has a more minimalist kit than Batman, 
and the gadgets have their uses. She can climb on the ceilings like Spider-Man, which you may think gives her an advantage by being closer to enemies without being seen. Except alerted enemies can see her climbing there, and she's a lot more fragile than Batman. So... What really ticks me off about Catwoman above all else is her animation speed. Being a more agile character, you'd think she'd be fast and elegant, but no. Just look at her animation speed to get to a ground takedown versus Batman. She's more likely to get hit because her windup is so slow. Instead, Batman is the fast brawler, and Catwoman reaffirms that acrobatics don't make you a great fighter. The other two characters, on the other hand, are great. There's Robin, who has a grapple that pulls him toward criminals instead of the other way around, a shield to knock enemies over, but also to block enemy gunfire, and the Snap Flash, which can be placed upon three criminals to knock them down, or stalk on an environmental object as a trap. He also decides to use a weapon, the Bow Staff, which doesn't do anything but give him different animations that range from cool to... controversial. Then there's Nightwing, wielding his own brand of stun batons and having that acrobatic flair, just less so than Catwoman. He pretty much shares most of Batman's gadgets, except for a tranquilizer that either stuns or knocks out an enemy, depending on where you shoot it, and an electric blast, where you come down from your perch and shoot out electric energy around you. For the most part, Robin and Nightwing are only found in the challenge maps, so let's talk about those. Combat and Predator challenges are back and play out as Asylums do. There is an additional mode called Campaigns, which groups specific challenges together but also adds modifiers that can add some difficulty. Admittedly, I only did one, but it was pretty fun. Mostly, I kept to regular challenges as Batman and sometimes Robin or Nightwing, which have either Standard Mode or Extreme. For combat maps, they just dictate the types and number of enemies you'll fight. For extreme versions of Predator encounters, it actually adds enemies like the Armored Thugs, as does another mode I'll get into. You can't take them down silently, meaning you'll have to experiment with your approach. There are also the DLC maps, which add some variety, like the Iceberg Lounge having infinite hordes, or this one, which is a 2D race to the end. One more mode to talk about is New Game Plus, which you get upon completing the story. It carries over all the riddles you've solved, and enemy placements have also been changed, especially in stealth, where the armored enemies also reside. Finally, it removes the indicators for counters and dodges, a major overhaul from its predecessor. In Asylum, Hard Mode did take away the indicators, which I guess was meant to promote replayability. You can play hard in Arkham City, but the indicators are taken away exclusively in New Game Plus. This is great, since I have been wanting more challenge in my games these days, but I don't want to make significant jumps in said difficulty unless I felt confident I can do it. Overall, this change means players will have more options. Oh right, speaking of extra options, Rocksteady added new costumes as DLC came along. Granted, there was an extra armor in Asylum that Batman could use in challenge maps after beating the story. These, however, harken back to previous Batman properties, even obscure ones. Most of them fit well with the graphical fidelity, while a few others are where all the cell shading went. You can change Batman's costume after being the main adventure, or right off the bat, no pun intended, in New Game Plus. One last aspect to discuss that has also been improved over Asylum is the boss fights. These villains have phases and more attacks than their predecessors, making them more of a threat. They do have convenient weaknesses, but I have lost one or two times trying to fight them. I would say more, but they are in spoiler territory. Just know that most of them aren't one-trick ponies like Asylum. To end the gameplay section, I want to give my overall opinion. I've been playing challenge maps in my spare time, and combat in particular is oddly relaxing. I do mix it up with predator challenges, which is a good practice in systematically accomplishing tasks. This is where the game's complexity lies and where I feel the best use of brain power is. This isn't something discovered during this review. It's how I remember playing the Arkham series when I was younger. Once I got to Arkham Knight, 
I basically mastered combat and could play and chill out. I had to throw the fight in horde modes because I had enough and slowly wanted to stop. If I wanted something more strategic, I switched to stealth. This is how it feels to master a game. Once you reach the high point, you're either bored and want to move on, or keep at it if it does something good for you. Still, I reaffirm that the gameplay is a drastic improvement from Asylum. It doesn't change anything fundamentally. Instead, it takes what's there and improves it. Where the likes of Call of Duty kept to the core gameplay but never really improved much, Arkham City takes leaps and bounds without compromising what made it good in the first place. People like Ranton may say The Last of Us Part II set a new standard for the industry, but no. The Arkham series is that standard. Now the story. Oh boy, the story. Arkham City does have some good ideas, like taking Batman and the player around to fight famed villains in their lairs. It's focused on being something more akin to the animated series that inspired it. However, the problem is that there are too many ideas, and the writers cram them all into one plot. The initial premise it starts with quickly gets sidelined for something else, creating branching paths that never truly intersect but get close to crossing each other. It's so convoluted that I've debated how to explain it. In the end, there is only one way to get the point across. Tell it linearly, as I did with Sherlock Holmes The Awakened. This is where spoilers and boss encounters come into play, so if you want my conclusion, go here. So, after escaping Penguin, Batman makes it his first imperative to free Catwoman, whom Two-Face captured in a prologue I never bothered to mention. Though, I will say that her voice actress, Greg That's Griffin, so does a great so job no portraying the temptress cat burglar many fans will recognize. I'm sorry I've been a bad kitty. Untie me, and I'll make it up to you. Batman saves her, and she tells him that Hugo Strange has been possibly making deals with the Joker. Speaking of Joker, he interrupts with an attempted shot to Catwoman's head, and Batman tracks him to the church where we reunite with Harley Quinn. I think you should do what he says. It would be a shame to get blood all over my nice new outfit. What do you think, Batbrain? Like it? Some of you may have noticed, but yes. Arlene Sorkin was sadly replaced by another actress, Tara Strong. Still, I think it's close enough and still portrays the obsessive chaotic character. She leaves, but Batman takes down the goons one by two by one, and saves the hostages before sending the clock tower to find... no Joker. Let's see, there was an asylum, some monsters, and oh that's right, you left me to die. Now you probably don't remember it that way, but who cares? You just need to worry about the bombs. Hurry up now, clock's ticking. Escaping in a cool cutscene, you head over to the steel mill and sneak in through another awesome cutscene. It makes more sense if you do all the AR challenges and get the grapnel boost. Inside the mill, Joker's goons are about to torture a doctor who couldn't find a way to cure Joker, but she gets dragged away instead. We save her and get the wreck. Why do we need it? To bulldoze the office door with a crane. We can now reach Joker, or get stopped by the ripped clown. While this guy is more of a sub-boss, he is still a formidable foe. He can be vaulted over as he attacks, but it requires precise timing. Finally, we reach Joker, who is seemingly dead. Surprise! <laughs> you fell for the old fake Joker gang, Batman! Batter up! <laughs> Or not. We then switch over to Catwoman. Yes, she has her own narrative, but there really isn't much to it and it has the least focus. In fact, you can condense this whole section into just a few cutscenes. So what next? Help tall, brooding, and handsome? Or help myself do all the loot Professor Strange has locked up in that vault of his? Hello, Ivy. 
You hear? You shouldn't have come here. Oh, come on. You're not seriously going to hold that against me forever, are you? You killed them all! Uh, they were just flowers, Ivy. I'll buy you some new ones. Look, Red, I just need your help! Never. Not again. Now, back to the stuff that matters. Joker reveals that he not only poisoned Batman, but also plenty of hospital patients in Gotham. Joker tasks Batman with finding Mr. Freeze, who was working on the cure before he cut contact. We track Freeze's signature towards the old GCPD building and find Penguin's men stationed in and around the area. Interrogating one of them reveals that Penguin has Freeze imprisoned in the museum, but we must destroy jammers to get inside without a hassle. We meet the Penguin, again, who attempts to establish himself as an intimidating presence in front of the stinking Batman. Ooh. Aren't you scary? <laughs> You're about to find out. Am I really? Penguin's self-confidence is because he has control over Freeze's... Freeze Ray, and has froze a few of Gordon's spies, who are also his hostages. Batman manages to save the ones in the room while navigating a thin ice sheet. It's a lot like Killer Croc's lair, Suspenseful looking at first, but it's not when you dive in. Except for that. We then save others spread around the museum, along with free- Okay, we beat brother number two, then we free freeze. Who tells Batman that the key to stop the freeze ray is in his suit? Where we get the disruptor. Get close enough to Penguin, disrupt the gun, then give a satisfying Divine Smite uppercut. By the power of God! It's not over yet though, because Penguin has one last surprise waiting underneath the Iceberg Lounge. Born on a Monday, christened on Tuesday, married on Wednesday! Oh yeah, this is going to be good. And good it was. Grundy's boss fight poses a good challenge in terms of his skills and your own. You need to be good at quick firing explosive gel, otherwise this fight will not go your way. All the while, you're dodging his attacks, trying to get yourself into position. Still, Batman handles Grundy, leaving Penguin to attempt any assault on Batman. Though you may know how this will go. With Penguin now locked up, and hopefully given something to use for air, Freeze reveals that the antidote for Joker's blood is insufficient. He needs a lasting enzyme to prevent it from breaking down. This is where the game introduces the most legendary villain into the Arkhamverse, Ra's al Ghul. His name is Ra's al Ghul. What? You mean Batman Begins lied? Well, it doesn't matter because one of Ra's minions overhears this and runs off but also leaves a trail to find. Which leads into an ambush, which Batman takes advantage of to place a tracker before Robin comes in to crash the party. As we're following the assassin down into Raish's lair, you're probably wondering, where is the Protocol 10 plotline? Well, it gets sidelined and reduced to this. Protocol 10 will commence in 10 hours. 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 Okay, I think I stopped it. There are also brief mentions of strange smuggling weapons to criminal gangs, but our first clue is that these gangs even have weapons at all. It also leads to the sidelining of Hugo Strange, which is a shame since the patient logs he records paint him as a cold, calculating, almost vindictive character. Interesting. So all you need is this coin, and everything is simple? Give me it! Or uh, what about this coin? Or this? Or these? <laughs> what are you doing? Proving a point. Fate didn't make you answer my question. I did. I replaced your coin with my own. See, you answered me because I wanted you to. 
you understand quickly that his motivation isn't to cure these patients. Rather, he just wants to know what it is that makes him tick. It also correlates with how he runs Arkham City, not stopping the criminals from doing anything outside the three rules he establishes. Most unusual. Continue with your patrol, Captain. None of the inmates match this M.O. I presume it to be merely a territorial dispute. A message, perhaps? Still, the fact that I had to look up background information to get the true capabilities of a character reaffirms that there were arguments over what the driving premise should have been. We make our way down, but Batman's vigor suffers, as seen by his health bar deteriorating every time he has an episode. He even nearly dies at one point, but he shrugs it off in Batman fashion. Bruce! Bruce! Can you hear me? Your vitals, they're dropping. It's like they're in free fall. You need to find whatever you're looking for now. <coughs> How long have I got? Oh, thank God. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. At this rate, I'd say minutes. Seriously, Bruce, you need to tell me what you want me to do. What do I get Robin to do? You know, if you don't... I'll make it. Batman makes it, and finds Raish's daughter, Talia al Ghul. <sighs> Hello, Talia. Okay, these two have a history. My father always intended us to be together, to command his army. Just imagine it. You, me, a better world. Okay, more than a history. The only way to get to Raish is by undergoing the demon trials. What are those? Lazarus-induced hallucinations where you navigate and fight your way out of... Whatever this is. The Lazarus Batman takes gives him his energy back, and extra time before the poison kills him. Batman finally confronts Raish, who looks like Liam Neeson if he went the extra mile with his beard. Raish goads Batman into killing him and taking his place, though Batman stubbornly refuses. Then, something out of Frankenstein happens. We then get to face Raish in a controlled hallucination and undergo another awesome boss fight. It looks like you're battling sand ninjas, but reality shows you fighting one on one against Al Ghul. That's not all, because he also turns into a sand monster. The blades protect him, but they do have a gap to shoot Raish through. Still, juggling the incoming attacks was positively challenging, in a way none of Asylum's bosses were. After Batman wins, Raish takes Talia hostage in a final attempt to make Batman assume leadership. Batman does have one trick up his sleeve, the remote Batarang being a target-locking boomerang. Why do I mention it now? Because this is the only time it's ever helpful. Talia and Batman have a couple's quarrel, and Batman gets a sample of Raish's blood. Al Ghul explains the Lazarus Pit and the psychological toll it takes, and Batman prompts him to destroy it or he'll be back. Getting back up to the surface, Robin and Oracle explain that the situation is dire and people are dying. Oh, and Major Sharp has become Arkham City's latest prisoner. You guys remember Sharp? The warden from Asylum? I hope so. Batman manages to save and interrogate Sharp, and it is revealed that Strange and an unknown associate are the ones funding his campaign. He only had to let Arkham City be built and let everything slide. Okay, I need to talk about this. They butchered Sharp's character, and here's why. In my Asylum review, I mentioned one of the collectibles being writings from a mysterious spirit of Arkham. Well, Sharp was the spirit, harboring dark thoughts of torturing and killing psychopathic patients due to traumas from his earlier years. It seemed like Rocksteady was making him the main villain, with Strange being put in charge of Arkham City because Sharp wanted someone whose methods were extreme, but effective. But no, 
Instead, it's strange that messes with Sharp's traumatized mind through psychotherapy and hypnosis. The developers turned a character who could have been a great surprise villain into a cop-out. What a missed opportunity. We get back to Freeze, synthesized to cure, and of course, Freeze won't let Batman take it. Joker has Freeze's wife Nora, whom we can find on a side mission later, but Batman isn't having any of it right now. Neither is Freeze. You will bring me Nora, or you will die. Now begins the best fight in the game. It's a stealth boss, so only the skills from that branch are useful. However, Freeze learns from each attack and immediately sets parameters to nullify a second attempt. Snuck up behind him, Jet Propulsion will now send you. Use the generator or electric floor? Those things are frozen forever. Glide Kick? Freeze the entire room so your cape can't be opened. Freeze is the intelligence of the AI, but increased tenfold. You don't have to do everything, just enough to deplete his health. <laughs> I think we got him. Batman heads over to take the cure, but Harley Quinn stole it during the commotion. Okay, so it's off to the steel mill we- We apologize for this interruption. We've been hit. Okay, we take out the snipers, save Vicky Vale, and then we- I managed to track Nora down to somewhere in this area. Please find her for me, Batman. Fine. We'll find where Joker has Nora, save her, then let Freeze know where she is. And then- Good news, Master Bruce. I believe we have identified the cure. Mr. Fox has manufactured enough to heal you and is working on a larger batch for the people of Gotham. Rocksteady's lucky that this is something Batman would do, but I'm still going to- More tea, Batman? Gosh darn it! Alright, playthrough Mad Hatter's admittedly cool dream sequence, and finally we get in. We blow up one of these canisters for a side mission, then- Now that all the Titan containers are destroyed, I should go back to Bane and see how he's doing. <laughs> go to Bane, fight together, get betrayed, betray him back, and then blow up Titan containers. I'm saving everything else for the end game. During a traversal section, Oracle reveals that Protocol 10 is a failsafe program for Arkham City, should it be deemed a failure. Gotham's higher-ups have given Strange the all-clear for carrying out the plan, not knowing that he was creating chaos inside the city from the beginning. After a long trek and getting a new gadget from a side mission, Batman faces Joker again. If you wanted to be cured so badly, you only had to ask. <laughs> you then fight him and waves of his minions until a cutscene disables Batman. Joker is about to land the killing blow, but Talia steps in, promising the power of Lazarus if Joker spares Batman. Though Talia has the tracker Batman planted on her personal gut. Are we not done yet, Ivy? I oh, right. Catwoman. I almost forgot she had a st- Wait. She's still hanging there? After playing as Batman for a couple hours at most? Or is Catwoman deciding to break into Strange's vault and meeting Ivy happening during Batman's second infiltration of the steel mill? If so, why divide their meeting into two sections and two different times? I don't know and I don't think we'll have an answer. Ivy agrees to break into the vault if Catwoman can also retrieve the only plant left in Arkham City. All this is pretty much condensable too. Find sewer, get into vault, grab keys from vault guards without a trace, take out guards afterwards, while finding out how useless Catwoman's ceiling crawl is. Break into vault, first retrieving the plant. Try and tie me up in your plants? <laughs> like hell. Oh, does that hurt much, Ivy? What the crud, Catwoman? Did you starve Ivy's plants on purpose too? Now Catwoman can get the Pulp Fiction reference, beat up some guards, and walk out while Protocol 10 finally commences. She sees Batman buried in rubble on the screen, and can choose between leaving with her goods or saving him. Which do you think I selected? 
Catwoman saves Batman, which, in story terms, relinquishes her of breaking her promise to Ivy, metaphorically Figure and physically. Outside, Batman sees what Protocol 10 truly is. Tiger helicopters soaring over everyone and firing rockets, bringing Armageddon from above. You know what? This makes sense as to why Strange lets the criminals murder and extort freely in the city, and why he doesn't impose true order upon them or meaningfully change them through psychotherapy. He already decided that they deserve death, so why bother? There's further dialogue where he plans to make more in certain cities, but... Strange. You will go down as the guy who failed to run a city prison. I don't think they're going to let you run anything anymore. Here is where we find Batman having his first real dilemma. He desperately wants to go after Talia, but everyone else needs him to save the criminal population. Well, they say save Gotham, but same difference. Batman must save Gotham. I'm sorry, but deep down, you know I'm right. Stopping Strange starts with finding the helicopter with the Master Control Program. In short, it'll allow Batman to hack into Tiger terminals you may have noticed were inaccessible with the Crypto Sequencer. The rest of the way is paved with combat and stealth. It properly introduces the Tiger units, who are fairly unique. They're the only ones with stun batons in the story, and are unbreakable in Predator encounters. Even down to the last few men, they will still be alert with only moderate fear. However, the final Predator stage, the top of Wonder Tower, is what sticks with me. The gargoyles are perched outside the area where the Tiger units are. There is a small platform thing up top, but it won't save you from gunfire like gargoyles will. Strange is there too, and will call you out if you're exposed. Still, Batman takes them out and saves the day. This is just the beginning. You cannot stop me. Soon I will command forces beyond your comprehension. I have achieved what the great Batman could never do. Gotham will forever thank Hugo. Strange! Oh. Oh. Your part of this is over. Professor Strange. Of course. Of course it was Rage the entire time. You know, the guy who made Wonder City and Wonder Tower, which has matching gargoyle heads that Batman pulls off to complete a challenge, the same tower that helps Raish Frankenstein himself to life. Is anyone surprised by this at all? Computer, activate protocol 11. What are you doing? Pass code. Wayne. No! Get out of there! No. No. Okay, that was a surprise. The victory doesn't last long because Joker, somehow, hijacks the monitors to announce Talia as a hostage. Following the beacon and taking down the snipers, the location turns out to be none other than Monarch Theater, where you can visit Crime Alley, pay respects to Bruce's parents, and even find a message from Strange. But that's for another time. Joker goads Batman into handing over the cure? Wait. Talia, no! Problem solved. What the crud, Talia? What does Batman see in you? Talia reveals that she took the cure, which Joker seemingly hasn't drunk yet. Oh, crud. You fell for the old fake Joker gang, Batman! Tell you! Oh. I'm sorry, beloved. I didn't know. <laughs> Encore! More! Bravo! <laughs> it wasn't never you. Not always. Well, 
sometimes. Okay, I will admit that while this was predictable, the setup was pretty good. The writing implies a lot, and the discrepancies are apparent. Still, there are very subtle clues that can be missed. For example, real Joker is the cameraman for fake Joker, as implied by his cough. Well, here's the thing. Answers don't give you everlasting satisfaction. Sometimes you need to brace yourself for disappointment. Now think about it. Imagine your favorite TV show. You've been through it all, the ups, the downs, the crazy coincidences, and then bang! They tell you what it's all about. Also, if you use Detective Vision during the Joker fight, he has no skeleton. So I credit Rocksteady's writers for attempting to put together an elaborate trap that did pay off. Talia dies, and fake Joker turns out to be... Ladies and gentlemen, for one night only, standing in for your truly and doing a damn fine job of it, I give you a The final boss isn't complicated, but is a lot of fun. Throw freeze blasts at Clayface while dodging his attacks and potentially bait him into blowing himself up at times. The second phase is cooler since you get to use Talia's sword against clay minions while timing your freeze blasts. It is also a bit awkward since the controls with the sword are either hyper-responsive or not very sharp. Finally, Batman downs some of the cure and prevents Joker from bathing in Lazarus. and maybe killing Clayface in the process. Though the game moves on from that, and to this scene where Batman debates either giving Joker the cure or letting him die. But Joker prematurely sets the choice in stone. <laughs> Think of it as a running no! Are you happy now? Do you want to know something funny? Even after everything you've done, I would have saved you. <laughs> that actually is pretty funny. And this is how it ends. No words from Batman, no explanation. Just gently puts Joker's body on a cop car and leaves. What happened? And a final Catwoman mission where she wants to get her things and leave, but instead blows up and lives. Two-Face stole them, but only gave half away, which prompts an endgame mission where you can switch to Catwoman and retrieve her stuff. She ends up not wanting to leave the city anyway. That's all of it. Now what's a girl to do? I could quit this crazy town, but where's the fun in that? By this point, you should know my gripe with the story. The writers clearly had all of these ideas of what they wanted Arkham City's narrative to be like, but didn't seem to agree on a predetermined path. In an ideal world, the plot should have been wholly focused on Protocol 10, slowly unraveling Strange's plan to eliminate the criminals by tracing the weapon shipments, slowly peeling away Strange's demented mind from the testimonies of supercriminals who have clearly had talks with him according to the logs. 
Catwoman could help by breaking into Strange's facilities and finding classified information. Also, off the script, but Mayor Sharp really should have been the surprise villain, completing his Spirit of Arkham arc. The other stuff would be DLC adventures, like Harley Quinn's Revenge, which serves as an epilogue to try and tie loose ends. Robin is the story's primary character, and is also voiced by Troy Baker. I'm in. Any news, Barb? No. He's been gone two days. I'm worried. You know what he's been like since... I'll find him. I hope you're right. Harley Quinn's preparing for some kind of siege. What's she planning? Find Batman and get the hell out of there, okay? So, off we go to save Batman. Remember left me to die. You left me to die. You left me to die. He's fine. The DLC itself does give some great insights. Harley Quinn's appearance changed again, though her outfit and hair resemble funeral attire. She's still mourning after Joker's death and will not hesitate to voice it. I've got what you call post-traumatic stress, brought on by the violent death of a loved one. My doctor tells me they might trigger uncontrollable bouts of guilt, or acts of extreme random violence. Too bad for him! Kill you for that. Cut out your tongue for my Joker. Oh, Why? Why did I do? Why? <laughs> Joker's gang has also undergone a significant redesign, reflecting Harley's position as the boss. While listening to some dialogue, some men are skeptical of her ability to lead and even contemplate leaving to pursue other endeavors. Harley's gone crazy since Joker. She was crazy before. Yeah, well, now she's crazier. She just wants revenge. You heard her. At least she's got the bat. Once he's dead, maybe she'll calm down. I doubt it. She's lost it. How do we know she won't just kill all of us in some crazy revenge-driven plan? Wouldn't be the first time someone tried something like that. That is a good point. We should get a plan together. We're gonna have to get the hell out of this place if things turn bad. You do get to play Batman in flashbacks, but they don't reveal much about his character. I guess Conroy deepened his voice to make him sound more menacing in certain parts, but it is also possible that Conroy was just sick that day. Tell me how to get through that door, and don't waste time lying. I'll know. The code. Give me it, or get ready to hurt. The code. Now! You can defend this by saying that Batman isn't one for outwardly displaying his emotions, which is true. I refute this by saying we've had glimpses into the Dark Knight's mind before, so why don't we get those glimpses in the DLC? Most of the story is somewhat predictable. Robin finds Batman meditating while inside a... Joker memorial. This is why I say somewhat predictable. But he manages to get the key from Harley, and gets Batman out. Though, Harley has one more trick up her sleeve, that being bombs placed all over the interior. We play as Batman for this one, and they're pretty simple to find and disarm. The final encounter with Harley is a battle with the Water City Guardians, which she's had on display almost everywhere. They have no indicators above their heads when fighting them, so you have to be aware if you want to keep the flow going. With that, we stop Harley and- Take it! Where's Robin? I thought he was with you. Oh, wow. She may have won. She may have killed Robin. One in an expected. Never mind, it was a fake out. Where are the cops? They're safe. I'm done here. This is why I agree that Batman's not one for outwardly expressing emotions. Yeah, sure. Let me wrap this up by saying that I still stand by what I said in the beginning. This is one of the greatest games of all time. The GOAT! <laughs> there are problems with the storytelling, but I went through the narrative again on New Game Plus, not just to get extra footage, 
but also because it's fun to play through. Mostly. Not to mention the challenge maps afterwards, trying out the additional skins, and all the new additions and improvements to gameplay kept me hooked. If you haven't played this game yet, do so. This is a game that I would put on a list of games to try before you die. Though I would say that for most of the Arkham series. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe or follow the channel, share with friends, and smash the bell to get notified of the next update. Also, comment on your opinions on Arkham City, particularly the storyline. And to those who are new, welcome aboard. I'll see you all in the next one. From the ashes of Arkham, the fires will rage and Gotham will burn. And you... No, no, not that one yet. There's still this one.